Before we get into the podcast, here's a quick message from our sponsor. Being involved in Bitcoin means you value freedom, financial freedom, freedom to save, and freedom to spend. Privacy, digital security, and no internet tracking logs are critical in the information age today. NordVPN is my favorite VPN service. It's fast, secure, and offers 5,500 secure servers in 59 countries. You can connect to any one of them and enjoy your favorite content no matter where you are. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. The best part about this sponsorship, there's literally no risk with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire situation never even happened. Check out our link, nordvpn.com slash blockware, to get your subscription started today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week, I have on Adam O from Upstream Data. Hey, Adam. How are you doing? Doing good, man. Glad to be here. It's uh, it's always fun to sit down and talk some energy, talk some Bitcoin mining. Absolutely. So as a Bitcoin miner, you know, I'm sure you've noticed that mining difficulty just made a new all-time high. Bitcoin price is, is well off its all-time high. And because of these two factors, hash price and, and miner margins are, are being very compressed. How are you thinking about the mining industry right now with, with margins this tight? Well, I mean... This is kind of the same old song and dance, right? There's with Bitcoin, there's this constant dance between difficulty uh, or competition, right? It's another word for it, but difficulty and then price. Um, no matter what, every four years, difficulty doubles, right? Um, in the sense that the reward halves, um, and so by the you know effectively the same function. And so what you can count on is diminishing hash value, which is right the, the value of a of a single terahash hash over the course of a day, but denominated in Bitcoin. So that's always pretty much going to be going down. Um, even when competition lightens up, that's only temporary because inevitably a halving will come. But when it comes to hash price, dollar denominated, that's that's an interesting metric, right? Because it's it seems to have, you know, gone no lower than what, about seven cents over the last five years six years um and i'm not sure it was ever it was much below that before then because a terra hash was so much back in 2014 2013 so um you know i think what we're finding is that the same song and dance of you know we we got up to what 40 cent hash price where a single new gen bitcoin miner was making over ten thousand dollars on a year on a yearly basis um and now we're down to eight cent, eight and a half cent hash price right now. Uh, this is this is the tightening. This is when those who have uneconomic energy uh, or unreliable energy, their or power, I guess, would be the better way to say it. They're they're hurting right now. Or somebody, you know, those who I was just on a phone call talking about it. Those who maybe overzealously capitalized back when Bitcoin, back when hash price was twenty cents, um, and you know they they paid too much for. For the hardware, they didn't get it installed quick enough, and now they have monthly bills that didn't line up to with what they projected early on. So, you know, these are the a lot of pain in the streets, a lot of conviction being tested, but you know, this is part of the fun. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I, I always I follow like uh, Charles Edwards. He has that metric called like the hash urbans, and it kind of showed that we had this quote unquote minor capitulation. While it wasn't you know anything super crazy, like. China mining ban or past halvings maybe, but um, we definitely did see like hash rate come off the network. Do you think we've seen like the worst of that or do you think there could be another wave of minor capitulation this year or next? The worst of it. I mean, that's minor capitulation is the best thing ever as a miner, right? I mean, nothing more you love than waking up and watch, you know, finding out that some of your competition just fell off. Um, I think I, I, I always blindly celebrate every every downward difficulty adjustment is a reason to pop a bottle of champagne and you know count your lucky stars, be grateful uh, because we're not going to get many of them. Um, 
not at least in the first million and a half blocks of Bitcoin, right? I mean, I've said it many times where the first decade of Bitcoin was defined by hardware, defined by having the latest and greatest, you know, most efficient chips where it didn't matter. Even if you had free energy, like, like free power, if you didn't upgrade your, your ASICs, you were still, you like couldn't mine, right? So that was the power was hardly a part of the equation for the first decade of Bitcoin or you know, at least the majority of it. The second decade of Bitcoin is going to be all about harnessing the most marginally economic power sources and waste energy, you know, stranded liability, energy dense production. Um, you know, whether that's biomass or even ethanol from CBD refining processes that there's an absolute land grab, right? A, a, a race westward to find and secure economic power on the margin because it'll it'll give you access to a really a bitcoin at the on a discount right you'll you'll be able to over time purchase bitcoin for for less than what it costs on an exchange and that's i think it's like the lowest time preference or or hash rate is probably the most precise measure of bitcoin demand right where it's it's really easy for somebody to go out and you know, purchase 50 cents worth of Bitcoin on, on strike or whatever. Right. And hold it for seven seconds and then sell it or something. Right. That that's not, a, I don't know if that's a great measure of demand, right? Spot price may not be that great of a measure of demand. Hash rate, I think is significant, significantly indicative of demand because, you know, you have to move physical real world world items. Um, you have to set up significant infrastructure in order to mine Bitcoin and takes serious capital risk with a very elongated return period, right? You're, now you're talking about participating in the production of Bitcoin for years, right? You know, thousands of days. Um, and so hash rate, I don't see it dipping very much because I don't see Bitcoin demand decreasing very, very much, even with price, right? When price goes down, sure, it's less attractive to bring on new hash rate, but we haven't seen much of a a letting up the last seven, eight months. And so, yeah, I count my lucky stars anytime difficulty goes downward, celebrate, you know, kiss your kids kind of a thing and hug your wife um, because it's probably going to be going upward for the majority of history. No, I definitely agree there. It kind of leads into my, my next question. What do you think about new gen mining rigs today? Like, what do you think about their longevity? Like, will rigs manufactured today remain relevant longer than like the very first ASICs did as far as their like efficiency competitiveness? Yes. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised with new gen hardware. I was, you know, anybody that, that knows me from the 2018, 2019, you know, bear market or knows what I was publishing out there in the world. Often I would talk about how I, I thought it was foolish to be the guinea pig, right? To go overpay for hardware that might not even, you know, live up to the, the advertised specifications. Um, what I, what we found is I think a, a more mature hardware industry than certainly we had with like the S9, S15, S17s. I mean, I think the S15, S17 series was like, things were not looking good. I mean, S17 might be the worst ASIC to have been produced in my opinion. I'm um, certainly for, for, you know, volatile climates. Um, but w what I've seen from what's mine or what I've seen from micro BT specifically the last two generations of ASICs, three generations of ASICs from the M20, 21s, 30, 31s, and now the fifties, um, and their water cooled, right? Their water cooled series is serious fabrication, serious production, right? Serious chip manufacturing, chip fabrication and, and ASIC production. Um, I would be very surprised if if these newer generation what's miners specifically didn't last at least you know five or six years without min seven years without minor repair you know fans being replaced maybe a PSU gets replaced um, but the boards ought to last a long time I mean people are still using S9s I mean we still out at upstream data we still have plenty of customers um, who on flare gas source you know sites they deployed S9s. And they're, they're still working. There's no reason to replace them necessarily right now. Some of them are maybe looking to upgrade now that prices are more uh, attractive. Certainly dollar denominated, they're more attracted, attractive. But I think we could see these. I mean, I think these new generation ASICs 
S19s, M30s. Um, these are the these are the machines of the future, right? These are this is it, right? I don't think it's going to get much better than this. The form factor may change a little bit. I think water cooled Asics are superior to immersion. I think water cooled makes a lot of sense in a in, in a lot of situations, um, and gives you a, a really high energy density capacity, right? The amount of the amount of hash rate and energy consumption or power consumption you can fit in a you know cubic foot is is quite dense and so quite intensive so i think we're not going to see much change certainly not in the in the way of watt per terahash or joules per terahash right we're where are we at we're at sub 30 we could call it right s19s are 29 and a half um m30 plus pluses are 31 but in low mode they drop down to about 28 and a half 29 um, and now these newer generation maybe are down to, I think some of them are advertising like 23, right? 24 for the X pro 146s or whatever they are. Um, and I think with some brains and even maybe some underclocking or some tuning, you might be able to get down. I've seen some guys post screenshots of, you know, 23, 24 watt per terahash. Um, I don't know how much, I don't know if we'll get sub 20 with firmware. I think maybe they're, you know, you might be able to tinker your way there maybe in an immersion system or something. Um, but sub 20 is, is tough, right? I, I, I mean, think about that. That's like, you could then come out with, you know, a, a, if, if your ASIC is going to consume 3000 or 3,500 Watts, right? I mean, you could, you could be like what, 165, 175 terahash at only that wattage. Like that's, whew, that's getting really nuts. I mean, we're already at five nanometer. And so, I think it's really tough to print at sub five nanometer. Um, it, this is these are the machines of the future. So the good news on that is that there there actually may be an argument for ASICs being underpriced. Where today they're priced at about ten to fifteen months their earnings, right? So you know an S nineteen is going to be priced at about. I mean today it's earning you know eight bucks a day, um, and so like I think what we're going to see is. The potential that maybe that maybe there that's a discount, right? Well, if this thing is truly going to last without much issue, and be economically viable for five six years, well, it being priced at only fourteen months might be a discount, right? Um, so, you know, it's early. It's, this is we are in the infant stage of certainly the hardware side of Bitcoin is still pretty infantile, and so you know, there's a lot of growth to be had. What I don't think we'll see is, I don't think we'll see the hash rate growth of the past into the future, right? And on a, on a total network capacity, I don't think we're, we're, we're just not going to see those percentages from having to having ever again. I definitely agree there. I mean, I think it's, we've already seen the market misprice ASIC, especially with, with the S9 after the, the May 2020 halving. We literally saw just holding the, the machine itself outperform Bitcoin by like 2x from you know, <laughs> May 2020 to mid 2020. Yeah, if you if you could find a buyer. Yeah. 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 How much? I mean, what, what what kind of liquidity do do these S9s have when price dumps? Not not great. Like right now, I mean, I have a hard time recommending to guys to to pay more than seventy dollars for an S9, right? And there's not very many people willing to sell them for less than that. So. For sure, for sure. But yeah, it's 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 interesting that efficiency of, of these machines just hasn't grown nearly to the same extent as it did you know before like before the s9 like you were saying back then it was all about you know in 2015 like buying the newest generation machine whether that was like a gpu or, or one of the first generation asics and just plugging it in wherever you can now it's it's more about finding that cheap energy yeah no and and it really speaks toward the total network hash rate. I mean, this is my thesis for, this is the bullish case for Bitcoin mining, I think, from an analytic point of view is, right now we're at a place, let's call it 220x a hash, right? And even make it just simple, we could just call it 200. Um, but 200x a hash, that's, that is a mass, I mean, nominally that is a massive amount of, of hash power, right? Um, like just, in terms of units, it's that we're, we're approaching the commoditization stage, and so what I know about Bitcoin's price historically is that if you know if Bitcoin's price does what it has done historically, hash rate cannot do what it has done historically. Hash rate won't be able to keep up. Not certainly not in any 
relative time frame, right? Where Bitcoin's price, you know, you would agree with me over the next six months, we could see Bitcoin go from 20,000 to 80,000, and that wouldn't be outside of the norm of, of Bitcoin's price slippage, right? That's a 4X. Um, would we be able to go from 200X a hash to 800X a hash? Absolutely not, right? And, and it's part of the reason that the having, you know, becomes kind of a critical aspect to this where, you know, now even a 100% growth rate every having epoch seems tough. Like 200 exahash, if you do the math on that, at, even at 30, you know, 30 watt per terahash or even 25 watt per terahash, I mean, that's a 25 megawatts per exahash, right? 25 me megawatts per um, million terahash. You need 200 exahash. Like you're talking about what? Five gigawatts of power? Like that's, a, that's immense, right? That is immense amounts of, of power infrastructure. Um, now, not to say that it won't happen. Certainly, if hash price is at 40 cents, somebody's going to be investing and in building that power infrastructure and racing to get hash rate online. But that's the bull, you know, that's the bull case. On the in-between, until hash rate can catch up, I'm going to be sitting here mining and catching all of that you know, extra arbitrage. I'm going to be catching all of that kind of fat um, that's in the market and all that froth because I'm already established. And so I'm going to, you know, roll with the punches through these seven cent hard times. And I'm going to wait for Bitcoin's price to, to do what I, you know, think it'll do. And in those moments, you know, it'll, it'll absolutely make up for any of the hard times we, we had to, you know, muster through, I guess. So I, you know, I think there's a strong case for that, right? I mean, if, if again, if say price doubled tomorrow, how much, you know, more incentivize are you to throw an ASIC on? Like all of a sudden, hash price is back to 17 cents, 18, even 18 cents. And it's like, you know, an S19 is making almost $20 a day, almost seven, you know, seven grand a year. Like this is all of a sudden becoming, you know, I should have been, I should have been, you know, deploying more hash rate while we were down here so that I could, I could take more advantage of, of this moment. And that's the name of the game, right? That's what's so cool about being the buyer, you know, a, a, an electricity purchaser of last resort or a, or a Bitcoin buyer kind of of last resort is you oftentimes can find yourself in a sweet discount like we did all through 2021, right? I definitely agree that, you know, eventually the Bitcoin price is, is going to rally to, you know, another parabolic bull run. And I think the mining industry will, will grow rapidly whenever that happens because, you know, we're all in incentivized to, to deploy more hash rate and to do that we're gonna have to be consuming a lot of energy um, what do you what are your thoughts on on the idea that some people say Bitcoin mining wastes energy wastes energy um, that's an interesting it's an interesting term period right um, what, what I think is, is this the, the less painful it is to waste energy, just as you know, as a whole, um, the more indicative it is of a of a very robust and abundant energy market in the world. Right. In other words, if if we just had say say for example, all of a sudden tomorrow we had you know ten times the energy production capacity that we do today, like what would the world look like? what would the world look like if I could, if I could consume, if you will, consume or, or convert um, a megawatt of, of power before I have a cup of coffee in the morning, right? Like, and economically do it. Well, that would mean that I have like, like one, I'm living in a world where we have insane abundancy of, of energy and power. Um, that's, that's what Bitcoin leads us toward and it doesn't lead us there by incentivizing the waste of energy it leads us there by penalizing waste wasted energy right before bitcoin for, for example in the oil field you flaring gas was such commonplace i mean it's still pretty much commonplace today that happens you know so frequently but it was such commonplace and and mentally right microeconomic behavior didn't associate any pain to flaring or wasting that gas. Producers looked at it as, hey, we want to produce this crude oil. Almost 99% you know, of the time that you produce crude oil, you get some associated natural gas. We burn that natural gas off because, you know, 
it's it's a cost of doing business. It's a cost of producing the oil. They they never there was not a direct penalty there. Now with Bitcoin mining, any oil and gas producer out there who's just flaring energy dense, you know, CH4 or methane, well, they could be earning, you know, with new gen ASICs, eight to 11, eight to $12 in MCF today, you know, eight to $12 per thousand cubic feet. So there's literally a stark dollar, you know, amount, a nominal amount uh, of pain associated with that activity. Bitcoin penalizes energy waste. Um, and through doing so, it will lower the time preference of energy producers, which will cause them to be more stewardly of the environment, um, cause them to be more efficient, better prepared, um, and, and ultimately be more economically efficient, right? They're, they will be, be able to better allocate their resources, which will bleed downstream to everybody, right? Again, it'll bleed down to every consumer. So Bitcoin doesn't waste energy. I mean, energy is never really wasted. It's never really consumed, right? It's only converted. Um, Bitcoin is going to be, or is the thing that is going to, to really revolutionize how we approach energy production. Um, because if you're wasting energy now, you're a dinosaur, right? You're an idiot. You're an, I mean, from a, from an investment point of view, you're, you're toast, right? You're never going to be able to compete. And so the bar has been raised, right? It, it increased the standard of energy production and power generation, the, there's no waste that Bitcoin caused. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin didn't cause any of this waste. Yeah, and I fully agree. I think energy is how you know civilization scales. That's how we have the great products and services and technologies that we do today. And if we're going to build a world where we have better technology and better goods, better services, we need more energy. So energy is not a bad thing. And and, and Bitcoin mining is somewhat like incentivizing the reduction of energy waste, but in a way it's also incentivizing the production of, of more energy to help you know everybody. Right. I mean, this is a harsh world, right? Like anybody who's tried to live in the environments, you know, anybody who's been, a, who's, who's experienced prolonged exposure, right. To, to the elements. Um, I, I personally, right. I've, I've done some expeditions in South America through Patagonia. You know, I've traveled to glacier and things. And I mean, this, this, environment i mean people kind of have this this notion there's kind of this idea that like the earth without humanity on it like if you just like removed all the people and the earth just sitting there and, and if we didn't impact it at all like that it's like this utopian you know garden of eden kind of place and it's just not right like we have to bear this this you know planet that we live on we have to bear the context of it and electricity specifically, but energy and electricity, energy and power are really what allow us to even live, you know, to be 70 years old, right? Um, to even have things like, like hospitals um, in abundance, right? Where there's hundreds of hospitals per state in, in North America, right? Um, this is, this is the fundamental, uh, I guess the fundamental fuel to comfortable living and to quality of life is is energy and electricity and so it's easy when you're living in an abundance you know in the united states specifically we i mean we are well off right we are well endowed with with natural resources and we have you know incredible infrastructure here for the majority of the world reliable power reliable energy is a matter of life and death right here in the in the united states you know we can we can talk about we can use intermittent and unreliable sources of energy and get away with it, right? Because we can we can back up our wind and our solar with abundant natural gas and things. But in other places, reliable power, reliable energy might seriously be you know the difference between life and death. And so, this is a matter of of bringing humanity into the first world is bringing humanity into a, a into a context into a a living situation where electricity and energy is abundant enough that it's economic for everyone to use at will, right? And, and that's, that's the world, you know, I, I want, right? That's the future I want. Um, the world I want for, for my kids one day is, is one where, you know, you can go and do research and development and waste gigawatts of electricity just trying to, you know, make a process better or trying to invent something new. And if you fail, it's, it's not like a massive detrimental cost. It's, you know, it's, relatively it's so economic that we can desalinate ocean water 
right? Um, heck, I mean, what if we have so much abundant electricity, we can just, you know, deal, we can actually um, tweak the atmospheric composition of the planet to however we want it, right? And control weather, right? I think that comes in a world where we have a nuclear reactor on every corner kind of a thing, right? Um, and so I, I just, I envision a different future, I think, than, than and, and have different assumptions than those who would maybe criticize such a, such a thing. Yeah, and in a way, I, I feel like your vision of the future is, is more of like a, a bullish future. Like you're more of like a, a definite optimist rather than maybe like a definite pessimist where you're like, hey, everybody stop consuming as much energy as you can. Like, let's conserve this. Let's let's just not destroy the planet. And you're like, hey, let's consume a lot of energy. Let's produce a lot of energy and let's make the world a better place. Exactly, right? Like, I, I, I hope that every person even can can have sovereign energy production, right? I think solar's a pretty awesome tool for that. Um, there's definitely some trade, you know, some, some downsides in the terms of like, if you're, solar panels break or have issues it's not really something you can repair yourself and i'm not even sure you can get it done on this continent but like sovereign power generation is something i think is is really great right i think it, it empowers empowering individuals makes the world a better pr place right it gives if i'm if i'm able to produce abundance amounts of, of power for myself again what kind of you know what kind of things and what kind of projects can I allocate that resource to that ends up having just immeasurable amounts of positive externalities um, for the world. And so, you know, we wouldn't have things like, like heart transplants <laughs> without, a, without living in a world where energy is incredibly dense, where you can like, you know, get a heart from a cadaver on a jet plane to a person who's in the middle of surgery in X amount of time, you know, like there is an insane amount of energy um, intensity to that process. But I love the fact that they're, you know, one, one day I hope to God I never need one, but if I do like it, it's an option, right? It's, we, we actually have the potential. And so the way I look at the world is, is, you know, pretty in line with kind of the Kardashev scale, right? This idea that he, the more, not just humanity can produce, but the more energy we can consume, the higher, quality of living we'll have, right? Human humanity will flourish. And one thing that's that Bitcoin, you know, the best argument I have for Bitcoin being a, t a tool to help humanity flourish is before Bitcoin mining, before the Bitcoin network, energy demand on the planet, on planet earth was strictly limited to human beings and what they demanded, right? What they consumed, right? There was kind of the, the total demand of planet earth in terms of electricity and, and energy. And then the Bitcoin network got created and it's kind of, it's this autonomous demand, right? Everyone, everyone that's a Bitcoin holder demands this, you know, this, this thing to continue, but it's, but we're not paying for the electricity, right? We're not buying the power from the miners, right? Or we're not buying the computational hash necessarily from them. We're just using the network. And so now with Bitcoin, we have planet earth and we have the Bitcoin network. And so anytime you, you have electricity or energy that you can't sell to anybody on planet Earth, you just shoot it over this thing called the Bitcoin network. And so the, the total demand of, you know, what we have in existence of, of electricity went up the, the moment that Bitcoin was created. It went up only a little bit. And with Bitcoin's price, it will catalyze all energy production where I, I don't think Bitcoin will be a very high percentage of total global energy production, but I think it will be incredibly abundant. Um, it, it'll be a part of every single, you know, energy production, power generation process will have some Bitcoin aspect to it in order to account for their loss, right? And, and be more efficient, send some power to this market because we can't get all of it over here. And so from, from the basis, you know, just from the foundation, Bitcoin is something that will encourage humanity to increase energy consumption. Um, if energy consumption is a bad thing, then Bitcoin is Satan, right? If energy consumption is a good thing, Bitcoin is, is the carrot to bring humanity into, you know, a higher quality of living and, and kind of the next societal stage, I think. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly agree that the Bitcoin mining industry and the energy production industry are basically merging and we're in the like first inning of that, like early first inning. That's a good way to look at it. They're kind of merging because every energy producer is now going to be incentivized to generate power on site 
with any excess energy they they can't you know distribute otherwise that's that's a good way of putting it uh, speaking of like long-term like like bullish ideas, do you believe in the idea of hyper Bitcoinization and like how do you envision the world? Then, if you do, I mean, I don't I don't really know what hyper Bitcoinization means specifically, right? Like, I mean, I think I think a world where Bitcoin is seen as kind of the global savings account, the risk-free rate of of return is either holding Bitcoin, um, the risk-free rate of kind of investment is maybe investing in mining Bitcoin, producing Bitcoin, um, or in other words, producing power, energy, or electricity, right? I think, do I subscribe, like, will, will that be the case? I, I think inevitably, with enough enlightenment, the world will wake up to the fact that Bitcoin is the best commodity for measuring value and exchanging for that value, right? And see, exchanging that value. I think, because that's what, what is money, right? Money is a commodity, period. It's right, right. It's the commodity best suited to represent a unit of account. Um, you know, it, it should, again, what, what is it supposed to be about? Identifiable, verifiable, fungible, um, transferable, all those, those kind of characteristics. Bitcoin beats them all. Um, and so I hope with enough enlightenment, which I ideally comes with time, the world will wake up to that. What does that world look like? Um, that's an interesting one, right? I mean, that's, that's a, that's a crazy world. That's a world where, where reckless borrowing is finally no longer incentivized because of this, you know, money printer situation where I mean, think about, think about how good of an idea you must have to borrow denominated in Bitcoin. Right. For example, you know, if I if I came to you, Joe, and I was like, "Hey, I want to, you know, I want to borrow ten Bitcoin from you, and I'll pay you back ten Bitcoin in five years." Right. Well, that's a scary. Th I better have a damn good idea for what I'm going to do with that. T I better have a hell of a plan for a return. Um, and if I don't, if I'm just going to go open a bunch of smoothie shops or whatever, like I'm going to get wrecked. And by the way, you're not going to want to loan that ten Bitcoin out to me because you don't have any like overheaded protection. The government can't just you know, create Bitcoin to cover you if, if things go wrong. So you're going to be very, very strict and diligent about where you place your Bitcoin because you know you could just hold the Bitcoin and that returns just fine. Um, it also, you know, a Bitcoin world, a, a Bitcoin standard implies a deflationary standard where which, the, the, funnest, the funniest kind of example I can think of, or at least what, what would be the most hilarious world, right? Is if like you fast forwarded a hundred years or something, right? You went to the future and you came down to earth and you saw the, you know, the, the guy in his suit and tie or whatever. And he, and he comes out of the office, comes out of the meeting with the boss and he like high fives his friend. And he's like, yeah, man, I only got a 2% pay deduction this year. Woo! Like, you know, like, like you celebrate the lack of a pay deduction rather than you won't get a raise, but we're not, we're not going to, you know, dock you nearly as much as Bitcoin has appreciated. So you're effectively getting paid more. Um, that I think is a, I mean, that's, that's literally laughable. Like that, that concept is laughable in this moment. It really shouldn't be laughable that that should be indicative of like, wow, you've like, whatever it is that you are using to transact and store your value can't just be created at, you know, for no cost out of thin air. Um, and so I think that's a better world. I think it's a more honest world. Uh, I think it's a world where, again, violence would be more disincentivized. It's much more difficult to take somebody's Bitcoin. Uh, that being said, you know, killing off an entire, you know, somebody that's holding 5 million Bitcoin and not having that Bitcoin get lost benefits everybody. So the scarcity just goes up. So like, um, there might still be like a, from a state level, there might still be some, uh, you know, zero sum gain, if you will, uh, to, to, to be violent, but the state always figures out a way to be violent. So they always figure out a reason to be violent. Um, I don't know. I think I, in my lifetime, probably not. If I'm going to be realistic, I hope to live long enough that I see some type of world like that. But what I can say about fiat money is it seems fiat money is on the ropes right now. It seems the petrodollar is on the ropes uh, because those who have been those who have been at a disadvantage 
right? Russia, any, any sanctioned nation out there, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, um, certainly any, any sanctioned nation that has abundant energy resources, they're, they now kind of have the tools to fight back, right? Where you see Russia demanding that, you know, any of their, any of their oil and gas assets, they're not going to, they're not going to trade them for dollars or euros. Like they're going to either demand their own currency or they're going to demand gold, right? Or they're going to demand other hard assets. And I mean, Putin gave a speech the other day about how the, the epoch or the, you know, the days of, of soft money, um, are soon to be replaced by the days of hard assets. And, you know, I'm not a Putin fan by any means. The guy's, the guy's a murderer and a, like a megalomaniac to the nth degree, but I don't think he's wrong in that regard because those who are, you know, at a disadvantage have a, have a huge incentive to destabilize the, the petrodollar. Um, and now they have the tools to do it. And so, you know, I think fiat has to find its, its last stages, right? We need to see fiat forfeit in other words, right? Either the U S dollar needs to like, they need to go, okay, fine. Like we're restarting the whole system. It's going to be backed by, you know, gold and silver and petroleum again, or something like that. Right. But backed by some reserves, um, which would crush confidence and everybody would wake up really quickly and start thinking about money. Um, that needs to happen before any kind of real Bitcoin, a big, you know, value proposition of Bitcoin can be, I think, deep deeply enough understood that people are willing to switch hundreds of years of of thought you know i mean it's just too early again we're in the first million blocks this is like you know the majority of bitcoin mining will be very very boring very low risk very low reward it's not sexy um for the majority of its history but right now this is the part of you know the bitcoin certainly mining and and how it interacts with energy this is kind of the sexy part right the first million two million blocks are when the disruption happens. Definitely agree. It's it's extremely early. I mean, working in the space now, you kind of get it, get into it. You go to conferences, you meet people, and you're like, wow, this is it. It's not. It's really not that big. And there's like no, it's so, tiny. There's so so few people that well, really nobody fully understands Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining. But there's so so few people that even have like grasp it, grasp the tip of of what this is. Oh yeah, no. I mean, did you see? So there was that that post the other day that went viral from some big account um, where he said that the having was now going to take place in 2023, right? Where, well, it made, it made me go down this rabbit hole a little bit. Which this is this is astonishing, right? This this is really proof that that Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, difficulty adjustment design was was well designed and successful because in the history of Bitcoin. Right, we've had about 13 years or so. Um, in, other, in other words, we just had the 5,000th day. We just passed the 5,000th day. And at 5,000 days, based upon the 10 minute block time, right, we should be at about the 720,000th block. But in actuality, we're at about the 750,000th block, right? So we're about 30,000 blocks ahead of schedule, which is about six months, right? So we're about six months ahead of schedule, but what does that mean in terms of Bitcoin supply? Because that's really the whole reason we have this difficulty, right? Is to the difficulty adjustment and mining. It's all about having the ability to to predict the supply, the future supply, with precision, but also allowing for open competition, right? And open production of the asset. Well, if it can be openly produced, how can we predict the future supply? We don't know how many people in the future are going to come produce it. Well, that's where the difficulty adjustment magic comes in. And if you look at the numbers, the numbers are this. If Satoshi Nakamoto was to guess, hey, how many Bitcoin are in circulation on day 5,000, right? How many Bitcoin will be in circulation? If he were to guess based upon the 10 minute, you know, block span, he'd only be off by like 180,000 Bitcoin. Okay. So less than 1% of the total supply that's, that's currently in circulation. You'd be less than 1% off 13 years ago. I mean, that's, that's precise enough, in my opinion, right? For for someone to confidently say, I know that in 5,000 days, like he could have guessed, okay, there might be, you know, 18.9 million to 19.3 million, but I know for a fact there won't be more than 20 million or more for a fact there won't be more than 19.5. So I know that I won't, you know, my, my 10 coins that I hold won't be debased more than this before this time period. And so what we're, what we're finding is one, like, 
it took it took 13 years to to move the needle just like six months um it, it would be an insane amount of of hash rate would have to continuously come on in order for it to, us to have the having in 2023 so that's not going to happen don't worry um but what it also means is that going forward that precision increases because the nominal amount of bitcoin that's left to be mined decre is decreasing and the nominal hash rate is greater so the amount of hash rate volatility ought to decrease as well and so every block bitcoin becomes you know bitcoin's future supply becomes more precisely predictable um, and therefore you can be more confident in the interest rate that you're going to get and so I mean, what a magical system right i mean like how do you how do you create a commodity that you can pre predict with precision its future supply but it also you know but you you have no idea how many people are going to potentially be producing it it's freaking magic it's the absolute best commodity to become money right it's, there's there's no question yeah I, that makes a lot of sense and i i think in a way like money is kind of this paradox where it's like it needs to be scarce but well distributed and it's like okay well how do you make something scarce but then distribute it out to the entire world and that's what kind of what you were just talking about it's well yeah how do you how do you even achieve fair distribution like what if, if right now but i mean try to like try to think of a world where you don't know bitcoin and because I've, I've, th I've done this thought exercise before and I fail every time, right? How, how would I have gone about creating something that would be fairly distributed, right? Most people would think equal distribution is fair distribution. What they would think is like, okay, we'll just give everyone on earth a thousand coins. And if you were born after this date, well, sorry. Um, like, you know what I mean? It's like, like that's where people would start to go. That, that is not at all what Bitcoin is, but it is the perfect, it is the most fair, uh, fairly produced commodity to ever exist because it has the lowest barrier of entry. You just, you need electricity and you, you need some, what I would classify as, you know, relatively abundant hardware, right? You need computer chips. Um, and so this is like, you know, this is kind of really mind blowing stuff, but it, it comes down to the fact that whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was or whatever group or whoever, they, they did they were truly behaving altruistically i think in their design because they came up with fair distribution right they didn't game the they didn't game it for for anybody um but they did reward those who they did reward those who participated with time you know time was a, a part of the reward right the earlier you participate more nominal bitcoin but the dollar value of that changes the game a bunch right where it's like it might be more it was more lucrative to be mining bitcoin you know, oftentimes, like even last year, than it was a lot of the time during 2013 and 14 and stuff, right? So, it's a, it's a wild, wild system. I mean, what a time to be alive! What a, what a project to have discovered, right? Yeah, in a way, I think it's it's kind of safe to say that it's it's fair enough to play the game, and and the game is to buy and hold Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fair enough to say that this commodity, nobody has. A, an unfair advantage um, to produce this commodity. Th those who have an advantage at producing Bitcoin, they earned that advantage, right? It's either they acquired, you know, economic energy resources or, or made, you know, smart power contract, whatever. But regardless, it's not an unfair advantage. It's not just like, oh, because you, your last name is this, mining Bitcoin's easier. Um, or because you're this tall or this color or whatever, right? Um, I, I've got no advantage over, I mean, there was a video on Twitter the other day, I don't know if you saw it, it was awesome. Some dude out in, in Guatemala that's mining Bitcoin on vegetable oil, right? He's got like a little, like a little, like I think it's truly like a repurposed, you know, car engine that he's running vegetable oil on, generating a little bit of power. Got like a few ASICs there. I've got no advantage. To the, in fact, his his, econo his power on the margin might, is probably cheaper than mine. Um, I've got no advantage to him, even though I might have access to, you know, way more resources and way more this way more that i can't produce power any more efficiently than he can um that's a thermodynamic law situation and so it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing bitcoin is right if you're coming from the point of view if, if you're on the side of the coin that you know unfair money production hasn't been benefiting you your entire life then bitcoin's a beautiful thing um if you're part of that group bitcoin's probably pretty horrifying yeah, I saw that video. That was pretty funny and, and makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's economic, economically incentivized to do that. Yeah. Um, 
How do you envision like the future of Bitcoin mining playing out? Right, right now we have these some large mining facilities like Riot's a Winestone facility, and then we have the exact opposite of that, which is kind of like the flare gas type thing that you guys are doing, or the the vegetable oil mining that the guy in Guatemala is doing. Do you envision you know large large data centers to keep getting built out, or do you envision more of like continue to just capture wasted only energy? Um, I think I think it kind of edges the middle a little bit, right? The there's a sweet spot in there, right? I mean, a lot of our customers are, pr from a mining point of view, are pretty darn big, even a power generation point of view, right? They might be multiple megawatt, um, even though they're behind the meter on natural gas. But they're, you know, my boss, Steve Barber, has talked about this, this, these forces at play um, where there's this force that incentivizes a miner to, to scale up, right? Uh, because you get some economies of scale. Right. There's some there's an economic force there, but there's these other forces that push down and, and the forces that are pushing down are things like privacy, um, things like having to get in bed with the with the state. Right. Regulatory threats. Um, and ultimately, you know, at a certain scale, it's impossible to be very flexible as a miner. Right. Like, you know, some of some of our producers, operators, like they might have a few Bitcoin mines that if they lost power there, I mean, they'd be able to pretty quickly, you know, move these things, get them to other resources. Um, I, I think, I think everything always will move upstream. Um, but I also think there's a caveat and I think there's a, there's a massive retail mining kind of small scale, what I would, what I would call gorilla mining, right? Uh, gorilla miner opportunity in the future that may not be as, as obvious today, um, or as, as a parent of a, of a market today because I think some strict regulations could could come around purchasing Bitcoin and withdrawing Bitcoin to a you know a quote unquote unhosted wallet <laughs> whatever the hell that means um, it's not even a real thing but so because of that right I often look at Bitcoin mining as a way to buy Bitcoin an immutable means to purchase Bitcoin and store my you know the fruits of my labor in an asset that can't be debased. Um, it's mining Bitcoin is an amazing way to do that because you just have to pay your power bill, right? I mean, so it's, it's much different than sending money to an exchange. You know, you don't need to give them the same kind of information, that kind of stuff. And it's pretty private. And so, and it's immutable. Like nobody can really stop you other than the, you know, the power company could try to turn off your power, but it's very tough for them to, to tell what you're doing with your electricity and stuff. And so in that regard, I think it may make sense for a lot of, smaller businesses and things to have, you know, a small mining operation because the way they look at it is, Hey, we just, this is our, our means by which to at least purchase a thousand dollars of Bitcoin per month. Um, even if it's, even if it's even, you know, at break even, even if it's like, you know, we're spending a thousand dollars in electricity and we're mining a thousand dollars of Bitcoin, like it's an immutable access to this asset that maybe they want. I'm not sure if many people are thinking about that now, but I think that will be a, a, a topic of concern in the future. But I, I truly think these mega miners are, are in for some hurt. Um, they're in for some regulatory hurt. And there's going to be some lobbying expenses that are going to be insane for them, right? They're to try to sway votes one way or the other because it's going to be a, you know, if, if this bill passes, then we're in deep trouble. We're somebody who maybe only has... 500,000, you know, 500 kilowatts of power operating on their, their farm in Kentucky, like they're not going to get regulated. They're, they're probably not even going to get discovered or known. Um, and so, you know, I think there's the force from the regulatory side that the force pushing miners to be a little bit smaller scale, a little bit more flexible. I think that's going to outweigh the, you know, the upward force and we'll see less mega miners. Uh, but more miners overall, which I think is a good thing, right? I mean, obviously, I think it's a decentralization of the hash rate. Um, ultimately, we need a, a true commoditization of the hardware. We need really another, I'd say another at least five years of abundant hardware uh, production and distribution because then there's enough hardware just like even in circulation that if like Bitmain and MicroBT, if they just stopped producing chips or whatever, for whatever reason, um, there'd be enough hardware, like even in circulation to last long enough that another player would get involved and start producing an ASIC or whatever. Right. So from a defensibility point of view, I think 
we're, we're at the level of hardware card com- commoditization. Big miners, I think they've got they've got more pain than they do like you know nice financing and and economies of scale on the horizon. We'll see how they navigate it, right? I think they've got a hell of a a job ahead of them, um, especially because you know you get if you get a million people in the United States running a single S nineteen right now, difficulty goes up fifty percent, right? Like fifty percent, like that's huge. The big miners don't want that, right? So. I'm afraid that they're going to try to, you know, create regulatory moats maybe um, to try to, you know, say, say that you got to get permitted or licensed in order to mine Bitcoin, try to kick out all the home miners, make them criminals or whatever. Um, we'll see how it goes. But I think I think those those gorilla miners are in a better position for the next, you know, five, five years than some of the, the massive guys are. Yeah. Switching topics a little bit. And it's probably one of one of the last questions. And you may not like it, but uh, what do you think about the <laughs> Ethereum merge coming up? Or the the post- ETH merge. Yes. Once we uh, post this, it'll probably have already gone through. But uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I don't. I don't have much of much of an opinion. I think. I think everybody who's interested in the ETH merge should should take a should take a look at that uh, the roadmap document that explains all of the steps of the ETH merge and, and take like a detailed look at it, actually read the words. Um, I think it's absolutely hilarious that they named the stages of the roadmap, the the merge, the surge, the verge, the purge and the splurge or something like that. Um, it's truly fun. Like this document, in my opinion, is, is funnier and stranger than satire. Uh, I, I couldn't have made a more elaborate and hilarious roadmap for a pro, uh, you know, a, a network project. If I if I tried, um, that being said, this is pretty expected in the sense that you know Ethereum, Ethereum is really not defensible against the state, right? In my opinion, the state could shut Ethereum down tomorrow, um, mainly by just telling Amazon Web Services to not host any of the nodes. Um, that would crush the majority of the network, and. It's not very defensible. So Ethereum has to placate to this this whole idea that consuming energy is a bad thing, um, and that the you know the human species is going to die unless we abolish fossil fuels and and unless we all start living like we're back in the 17th century and stop consuming electricity. Um, like they have to subscribe to that because that's currently kind of the the global narrative from the state and so they can't challenge the state bitcoin the government could make it illegal tomorrow and but they can't shut it down right they could they could subpoena amazon people aren't running nodes on amazon i'm running nodes on my own dedicated hardware right and so um it's it'd be very very tough for the state to shut down bitcoin Ethereum's not the case. So I, I see why they have to placate. Um, the merge is just a way to create a, you know, the old model of central banking, Keynesian central banking, where the few control the ledger. Uh, they're just doing that on the blockchain, right? They just slapped a blockchain on a, on a central banking uh, structure and, you know, celebrated it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not truly interested in it, but I think it's fun to kind of watch how, one, they market it, right? I mean, the, the problem I see is once there's no more merge to talk about, all they're going to be left, all that's left to talk about is how bad Bitcoin is for the environment. And I feel like they're just going to really lean into that. And so, you know, it's, it's something I've seen coming for a long time. So I've been trying to get ahead of it for years now, right? Trying to really get out there and show people how, how Bitcoin is, is probably the greatest thing um, to happen to energy production. And so, I guess we'll see, right? I'm not trading it. I don't have any advice on how to profit off the merge. Um, what I will say to those who stake their coins is good luck. You know, I, there's not even there's not even a specified date as to when you'll be able to withdraw your your coins from, from your staking position. So, good luck, um, I guess. And you know, I I think uh, hopefully people don't get wrecked. You know. Yeah. It's the best thing you could say, I guess. Hopefully, you don't get wrecked. But yeah, I just, I mean, people 
people getting wrecked is no fun. Um, this is the time too where people are, are are feeling pain. A lot of guys who are trading, you know, ETH and whatever else are, you know, in serious trouble right now um, because you know they were maybe trading it for family members or whatever else. Like I've heard some horror stories out there, and so you know, real world pain's no good, and I don't I don't wish that on anybody, but you know, I guess to each their own. I, I think anybody should be able to purchase whatever money they want. So if, if you want to, if you want to buy ETH, you know, I think you ought to be able to. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. though. I think this is a great conversation. Where do you want to send people after this? Do you have, you know, I know you got a Twitter. What's your Twitter? What about upstream data? Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I'd say definitely check out upstream data. Um, we're at upstream data.ca. Um, and, Definitely give a look there. Um, check out Steve Barber on Twitter. He's SG Barber, and check myself out. I'm Denver Bitcoin. A um, lot of great resources. You know, feel free to to reach out to me if if you've got questions and stuff. I can at least you know if I see them, I'll help you out, point you in the right direction, get on the phone with you, whatever. But certainly, if you know you're looking at deploying ASICs um, in any kind of a remote or uh, modular capacity, right, where you don't have rack space, I think. You know, it's safe to say that having portable rack space makes the most sense. So give us a call at Upstream Data, and we can we can help you out. We've got really great prices. So other than that, you know, check out check out Bitcoin. Check out Hope.com. Um, you know, the Bitcoin is a is a carrot to learn about pretty much all other topics that are relevant to <laughs> human life. And so I think Bitcoin's a great carrot to go down the energy rabbit hole, but also just to learn what money is. Don't stop. Don't stop uh, asking questions. I guess would be the, the the best piece of advice I can give to anybody that's that's watching this. Absolutely. Well, enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on. We'll do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Joe. Appreciate it.